you sing. Oh, Jesus, paid it all. Thank you, Jesus. All to him I owe. Come on, every voice we sing. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. Oh, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sing. Oh, praise the one who paid my death and raised this life up from the And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up. Come on, we sing it out. pray together. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for our sins, uh, that because of you, we can be made the righteousness of God through you. And Father, thank you that though you needed a sacrifice, you willingly put yourself in that place so that we could be and experience eternal life with you in heaven. We thank you for that. Thank you not only for our salvation that's found in you, but thank you for your eternal word and how you have given it to us to understand you, to know you in a greater way, and I pray that this morning now as we continue our study that uh, you would speak to us as only you can. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church family. You can be seated, and kids are dismissed for Kids City. I can't tell you how many times while we were singing that Royal said to me, Dad, we have Kids City today, so he wanted me to make sure <laughs> that I knew that he wasn't going to stay for the preaching. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's really great to see you guys this morning, and I hope that you've got your Bible with you. If you do, let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 as we are continuing our verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've been learning a lot, and uh, I hope that you've been encouraged as well through the time that we have. And I love expository preaching because we just work through uh, the Scripture verse-by-verse, verse, understanding uh, what it is that God has for us. And this morning we're going to continue that as Peter is writing to, Peter, this is the Apostle Peter, and he's writing to a group of individuals, people uh, that had been uh, scattered. They were strangers and pilgrims is the title of our series. And the reason they were that way is because many of them had to flee their hometown, flee their home cities because of persecution, 
because of challenges that came into their life just because they were followers of Jesus. And so he was writing to these individuals because he did not want them to, you know, get uh, outside of, of Jerusalem or get outside of Israel or wherever it was that they heard the gospel, Corinth or whatever city there was a church and get outside of it and begin to forget and begin to be discouraged. He wanted them to in, in continue on and to recognize that, yes, in fact, even though you may be far away from a group of believers or even a local church, you can still follow and you can still serve God uh, with your whole heart because you have the Holy Spirit of God with you. And so Peter was writing to encourage them in this. But one of the things that Peter talked about a lot was the fact that persecution was going to come, trials were going to come, difficulties were going to come. You know, I think if there's anything that I've learned in the last two years of chaos, which I think we're oh, past two years now, aren't we? Two years or so of just most of our worlds being thrown completely upside down. I think if there's one thing that I've learned through all of this, I've learned this. <laughs> I'm not surprised by anything anymore. Anyone else feel that way? <laughs> and I'm not just talking about COVID stuff. That was a part of it, yes. Uh, but, I mean, all sorts of things in our society. And, and more and more I find myself, as I'm maybe watching the news, which I try to avoid a little bit these days, if, I, if, I, if I'm watching the news or I'm reading articles or I'm catching up on things, uh, the different podcasts I listen to and blogs I read and, and news sources, the more often I find myself saying, nah, it'll never happen, or no, they'll never do that, or no, it'll never come to this. And then it happens, right? It's led me to the fact that I'm just like, you know what, I, I, I just... Anything is possible, right? <laughs> Anything is possible. Now, that's also a, a, a mindset, I think, that happens in the Christian life as well. The longer that I'm a Christian, the more that I follow after Jesus, the more that I mature in my faith, I come to the same conclusion. There's no reason to be surprised by anything that happens in our world today because I know that we live in a broken, fallen world, and I know that one day a perfect righteousness is coming. But I think if there is one aspect of the Christian experience that many believers seem to be surprised when it arrives unannounced in their lives, it is the subject that I've already mentioned. That's the subject of suffering and the subject of trials. Because as much as we as Christians understand that our salvation was bought and paid for by the suffering of our Savior, and as much as we know that we as believers today are to follow in his example... We seem so surprised with the fact that there might be trials and suffering and difficulty that comes into our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. It's like when we get saved and we move on and then something bad happens, we're like, what is happening, right? I thought I'm a Christian now. I thought Jesus was going to make everything perfect and God was going to make everything right. And we seem so surprised by it. But I want to mention this morning, and we're going to see this here in a few moments, that the Christian should not be surprised that suffering and trials continually show up in our lives. They continually reveal themselves. This is a lesson that a man by the name of George Matheson understood. He was born in 1842, so a long time ago. And he was a man who went through a lot of great difficulty in his life. By the age of 18, he was completely blind, had no sight at all whatsoever by the age of 18. And he was someone, though, who wrote a lot. He wrote uh, some hymns that, that some of you might be familiar with. But the, one of the things that he talked about a lot was the role of suffering in the life of the Christian and how we should not be surprised and it should not, be seem, it should not seem strange to us. I want to read you a quote from one of his books that really spoke to me uh, in my study this week. Here's what he said. He said, There is a time coming in which your glory shall consist in the very things which now constitute your pain. So what he's saying is the things that you are in pain right now ultimately will reveal the glory of God. In fact, you may look back on and recognize them as a glorifying time. And he gives us some examples here. He says, nothing could be more sad to Jacob than the ground that he was lying on, a stone for his pillow. If you remember that story there in the Old Testament. It was the hour of his poverty. It was the season of his night. It was the seeming absence of his God. But yet the Lord was in that place and he didn't even know it. When he awoke from his sleep, he found that the day of his trial was the dawn of his triumph. Ask the great ones of the past what has been the spot of their prosperity, and they will say, it was the cold ground that I was lying on when I experienced God in his fullness. Ask Abraham, and he will point to the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Ask Joseph, and he will direct you to a dungeon. 
Ask Moses, he will date his fortune from his danger in the Nile. Ask Ruth, she will bid you build her monument in the field of her toil. Ask David, he will tell you that his songs came in the night. Ask Job, he will remind you that God answered him out of the whirlwind. Ask Peter, he will extol his submersion in the sea. Ask John, he will give you the road to the island of Patmos. Ask Paul, he will attribute his inspiration to the light which struck him blind. And ask one more, ask Jesus Christ, ask the Son of God. Ask him where uh, his rule came over the world, and he will answer from the cold ground on which I was lying in Gethsemane. Now, isn't that spectacular? <laughs> I read that over and over and over again this week as it just spoke to me so much about the fact that in our suffering and in our trials is often where God gets the most glory. It is often the, the, the times in our lives that we point back to that we say, that's where I grew the most. That's where I was the, the closest to God. This is where I grew in my faith. Peter reminds us of that fact, and this is where we pick up the passage today in chapter 4 and verse number 12, where he tells us that, listen, beloved, and he's speaking to Christians here, he says, don't think that it is strange, in verse 12. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing is happening to you. (laughs) Today's subject is trials, in case you haven't figured it out yet. (laughs) Today's subject is suffering. It is difficulties that come into the life of a Christian. And Peter here begins, point number one, by encouraging us to, he just says, don't be surprised at trials. Don't be surprised at trials. Look back there at the verse. Don't think it's strange. And then at the end he says, "As, as though some strange thing is happening unto you. Now, Peter here is so great at clarifying for us what we need to understand as followers of Jesus Christ. He says, don't be surprised. Don't think that it is strange that if in the Christian life you have difficulty. Now, Peter's covered this extensively in chapter number one. He's also extensively covered it in chapter three. And those are all sermons that we've covered in depth this subject. If you want to go back on the YouTube channel or the podcast, uh, you can go back and listen to those messages where we dig, dig into it a little bit more in depth. But obviously it was something that Peter wanted to continually remind us about, this extensive truth that in the Christian life there are various, there's a multitude of difficulties that we face. Every single one of us is going to have a season of life where we are going to lack some provision for our needs. There's going to be a season of life where uh, maybe uh, we don't feel as protected as we should be. There's times where we're not going to feel as stable as we should be. There's times that uh, there's just going to be some general trials and difficulties. There's also going to be opportunities in our life where you personally will experience physical pain and suffering. There's going to be times that people that you love dearly are going to be in sickness and chronic pain and, and struggling. There's going to be opportunities and moments in your life where they're going to seem very dark as you personally are battling against temptation and struggles, and our adversary, the devil, is just coming after you, as scripture describes him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and you feel like he's already got half your arm in his mouth, (laughs) and he's coming after you. And there's those times that are dark and difficult and a struggle, but on top of that, there's there's moments in the Christian life where you might be the recipient of a verbal or a physical persecution that comes up in your life simply because You are a follower of Jesus Christ. Today in our world, of course, it's most often seen in verbal attacks. You know, people putting you down, maligning you, uh, you know, pretending like, or or just, you know, speaking to you like you don't exist just because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and they know that. We understand that. But there's people all around our world today that are seriously suffering physical persecution. More so than at any time in human history, there are people dying for their faith all around the world. We're so insulated here In Canada. But these difficulties that we may go through, and you can probably think about one right now that you're facing. You might be thinking about a trial that you're in. All of these, though, may be temporal, they may be occasional, they may even, in some regard, last throughout our lifetime. But in the end, for those of us who know Jesus Christ, we know that the end of all things is at hand. We just covered that in our previous messages. The end of all things is at hand. That means Jesus is coming back. And so as believers, though there is trials, though there is difficulty, we recognize that while they are inevitable, they are not permanent for us. And we can praise God for that. And so we look forward to the return of Christ where our earthly suffering will be eliminated from our memories as we enjoy eternity in the presence of God. And as Christians, we look at suffering in this life very, very differently because here's what we understand. We know that we may suffer in this life like our Savior did, but one day we'll enjoy the security of heaven forever. And so we praise him for that, and we're thankful for that. 
However, there are those in our world that are without Christ that this world is as good as it's ever going to get for them. This world is as good as it's ever going to get because if they do not turn to Christ in repentance, if they do not fall on their face and, and repent and turn to Jesus and accept him as their Lord and Savior, their suffering will only begin when they leave this life. But for the Christian, those of us that follow God, he's speaking here, he says, Beloved, don't be surprised when you're going through trials, even if it leads up to persecution. And instead of being surprised, he tells us how we should respond in our second thought where he says you need to rejoice in your trials. You need to rejoice in your trials. So he says don't be surprised, rather rejoice in your trials. Look at verse 13 and 14. But rejoice. Well, look at that. He says it. It's pretty simple. Verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. There's that word again. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now this whole idea of rejoicing and suffering is very, very difficult to do, okay? It's very hard to do. No one likes to suffer abuse or pain of any kind, especially if it's inflicted by someone that is close to you. Nobody wants to walk through that. Nobody wants to experience that. And so it's difficult to rejoice in suffering. However, this is an encouragement that we see all throughout Scripture. Constantly rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And not only are we told to rejoice, he doesn't just say, hey, like, get it together, man. Just be happy, okay? That's not what he's saying. He gives us ways that we can rejoice, how we can rejoice. Notice here a few in this passage. He says here, when we rejoice, we are sharing in Christ's suffering. Do you see that there? He says, rejoice in as much as you are partakers in Christ's sufferings. What does that mean? It means that just like Christ was rejected of men, just like Christ uh, suffered and lived his life proclaiming the righteousness and salvation of God, and he suffered for that in the same way, if we suffer for the same reasons of, of proclaiming Christ and of telling others about the gospel, then we are sharing in the very sufferings of Christ himself. Think about it. The, 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 the disciples, I mean, they went through so much for Christ. And in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 41, after being in prison and beaten for preaching Jesus, this is the attitude that they had. Notice here in Acts, chapter 5, verse 41, it says, And they departed from the presence of the council. What does it say there? Rejoicing. <laughs> Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The Christian looks at suffering and trials for the cause of Christ differently because it is a privilege that we understand that we would join Jesus in his suffering, to be identified, to suffer because we are identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. So when we suffer, we have joy because we're sharing in his sufferings, but also we joy because we know that we'll be greatly rewarded when Christ returns one day. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he says that there's an inheritance that is incorruptible, it is undefiled, and it fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. So as a Christian, we know that the trials and the suffering that we endure, that we walk through with joy, that we walk through without losing our testimony, that we walk through without losing our faith, we know that there's a reward waiting for us one day. And I'm thankful for that. That, that helps you get up in the morning sometimes. Just to know that, you know what, I need to endure, I need to continue, I need to pursue. Another aspect that we understand from this verse is that when we suffer, the Spirit of God is on us. Look back again at verse 13 and 14 there. Notice there in the second part of the verse, he says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, so if you are attacked, reproach means slandered. So if you're slandered because you are a Christian or you're trying to live the Christian life and you're trying to have a, a life of character, he says that happy are ye. <laughs> Now, this can play out in some weird ways if you want to take it that way when someone slanders you. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many of you have ever had your name cursed and just because you're a Christian. I've experienced that many times and just be like, thank you. That really made my day. <laughs> I don't know if you need to respond necessarily in that way. But the point is, he says, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, if someone slanders you, attacks you, goes after you because you're living for the Lord, because you're trying to follow and pursue the word of God and its righteousness, he says, you can be happy. Why? For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. This is really interesting. It says, on their part, the person he is evil spoken of, so they're slandering God when they're slandering you, but on your part, he is glorified. 
So the person who's slandering you and reproaching you and attacking you, they are, um, uh, they are evil. They're speaking evil of God, but he is being glorified in you. And then notice here that there is a spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests on you. This is so interesting here. What he's saying is that because what you're experiencing is a part of what Christ went through, when you are suffering because of that, there's a special spirit of strength that will see you through. You know, if you were to look back at your Christian life, I don't know how long, I know many of you are new Christians, you've been a Christian just maybe a year or two or a few years, but if you look back on your Christian life, here's something that is so interesting, the longer that you live for the Lord, you can almost pinpoint the times in your life where you fully experience God's love and his grace and his strength, and what is so interesting, when you pinpoint those moments in your life and you say, man, this is when I experience the strength of God, and you know what it the pinpoint is always in, it's always in a time of suffering. It's always in a time of difficulty. It's always in a time when you are like, I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to walk through this valley. And this is what he's talking about here. This is what Peter is saying to these scattered believers, people that were far from their homes, that were facing, as we know, a intense Roman persecution that was about to come. It was just getting kicked off about this time as, as Nero needed a scapegoat for why he decided to burn down the city of Rome. Some real heavy persecution was coming. Right at AD 63 is right when Peter was writing this. Peter himself was about to be crucified upside down for his faith. The reason he was crucified upside down is he said, I don't even want to die in the same way that Jesus did. And so he was martyred and killed for his faith. And he's writing, I mean, we're talking months before this happens. And he's saying to you, it's in these times of difficulty and in these times of suffering that God has this, spe- there's a special glory, the special presence of God that you sense. And just by seeing some of you nodding your heads when I said that, pinpoint it where it is, that's when you know. Man, this week I was thinking about some just, some past difficulties and, and in light of this passage and I was reflecting on my own life and I was like, man, that is so true. <laughs> that is so true that God speaks to us, he comes to us in those moments And in those moments where you may feel like God has abandoned you, you are in fact living in a very special and unique time when God's favor is upon you in a special way. And it's because of his strength and his grace that is there for you in those trials, you can rejoice. That is the unique mindset that the Christian lives in, is that even when things are difficult, we can still say, you know what, I can rejoice because I know that God is with me. I know that he's going to walk with me through this valley. I know that he's going to be reaching out his hand for me when I feel like I'm drowning. And God is going to be the one that's going to come alongside me in this deep, dark valley, in this difficult time. We have the special presence of God, the special spirit. It's so unique where he comes through to, for us in our suffering. And so then we can rejoice. Then we can rejoice. Not in an annoying way, right? You know, some people rejoice a little too much, right? <laughs> Like, you know, your, your, your leg just got cut off. It's all good. <laughs> Maybe you don't know anyone like that. I don't actually. But, you know, there's people, some people are super rejoicing all the time. I'm not saying in like in a creepy way, but in a genuine way. You know what I'm saying? Genuine. <laughs> Help me out here. Genuine. Genuine way. And that's what God has for us. And we can do that as believers because we know, we know that God is with us. Okay, so that's the second thought here. But the third thought we see in this passage is that you need to recognize your role in trials. So he says, don't be surprised that trials are going to come. Secondly, he says, you can rejoice in those trials. But thirdly, you need to recognize your role in trials. Look at verse number 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in every or in other men's matters. You can say in just everybody's business, right? Now, I can relate to Paul here because I feel like he writes in sort of how I think, which is sort of like an ADHD way. You know, he just sort of bounces around. And you see this in his writing. He'll be talking about a subject, and in the middle of that subject, there'll be this little phrase here. And that's what we're seeing here. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about trials. He's going to go back to that in a moment. And then right here he says, hey, but make sure you're not murdering anybody, okay? I just want you just let me put that out there. Maybe there was a problem with that. I don't know. You know, make sure you're not murdering. Make sure you're not stealing. Make sure you're not an evildoer. Make sure you're not uh, uh, all up in everybody else's business and causing problems. And then he has this like little phrase here. And what's, what's the point? What is he trying to say? He's trying to remind us of the fact that, yes, we do suffer, but some suffering is our fault, is what he's trying to say. 
Some suffering is your fault. See, the other side of this coin is that when you're suffering for your fault and you're like, oh man, I just need, I just, I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm suffering for Jesus. You know, I didn't save, I spent all my money, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't take care of my family, and now I'm suffering, you know, for Jesus. No, no, no. He says there is suffering that comes as a result of your actions. And so if you're suffering for breaking the law, if you're suffering because you sinned against somebody, you're suffering because of your own character uh, ineptitude, you will deserve the punishment and the suffering that you receive. And there's no blessing, there's no special presence if you're suffering because it's your fault. Okay, so he just puts that in there. I love that he drops that in there real quick uh, and just sort of says, all right, remember, if you murder somebody and you go, to, you, know, and you go to prison and you face death yourself, it's your fault. Just a reminder. So recognize your role in trials, okay? Now, there is a danger in that, and I want to just point this out real quickly. There's a danger that we try to connect all of our suffering to something we've done wrong. You ever done that? There, there's a danger in this, you know? Now you get a flat tire, oh, I should have never called Billy stupid in fifth grade. I know that's what it is, God got me back, okay? God is not this vengeful, attacking God. That's the, that's the problem with the way our minds are sometimes. We then try to connect everything bad in our life to some specific thing, okay? But I think you understand that for the person that has the spirit of God, that is thoughtful, that, that considers their life in the right way, you understand that there are some sufferings that come as a result. So don't try to make it about suffering for Jesus if you, you're, in fact, are the reason for that trial. But we continue on now to the fourth point that we see in verse 16, where he says, don't be ashamed in your trials. So don't be surprised. You need to rejoice. Recognize that you do have a role. But fourthly, don't be ashamed in your trials. Look at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Now this is basically the idea here that if you are in suffering, don't be ashamed of that fact. If you are suffering because of Jesus Christ, uh, recognize that you do not need to be ashamed. Rather, just continue to take a stand and just be like, it's okay, I'm a Christian. So often in life, we're fearful of what other people might say about us. We don't want let people, we don't let people know that we're a Christian. I know I, I even face this sometimes because, uh, you know, I meet people at my kids' baseball games or different places. Obviously, uh, uh, I do have friends outside of church uh, and, you know, people that I know. And oftentimes people say to me, well, what do you do? And you know what my temptation is? Uh, yeah, I'm a web developer. I have a you know, small business. I do this on the side, you know. Oh, and sometimes I pastor a church. No, no, you know. And God convicted me about that. Because I used to think that if I just lead up like, hey, I'm a pastor, that people would some, then not want to talk with me. Now, guess what? That does happen, actually, <laughs> recently. Recently, actually, they're like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, I'm a pastor of a church. And they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then they just left. Like, they just walked away. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I get that sometimes, and that's okay. Uh, if, if they won't be my friend or talk to me because, of what I, because I'm a Christian, then that's on them. That's not on me. But the point is, don't be ashamed of the fact that you're a Christian. You know, we live in a society that is so driven by identity, right? And we all try to find these identifiers to identify ourselves as unique or different or special. If you really want to stand out in this world, lead with, I'm a Christian first. I'm a Christian first. Above anything else, I'm a Christian first. And after that, I, you know, I do whatever else I do. Don't be ashamed of the fact that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to minimize it. Listen, I think today, more than anything else, we need Christians who are willing to stand up and just say, and here's what's funny. When you do that, there's always somebody who kind of comes out of the woodwork and is like, hey, I'm a Christian too. You know, and then they do the secret handshake, right? Have you, did we teach you that yet? We haven't, okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> there's no secret handshake, okay, or signals or anything like that. Well, there is a slow nod. Yeah, all right. Christian, all right, okay. It's interesting how sometimes when you just stand up for God and you're not ashamed, how others will, will show up. It's so interesting, so interesting how that happens. So don't be ashamed. Do not be ashamed of your trials. Of course, this is within the context here. Suffer as a Christian, but don't be ashamed about it. Rather, glorify God on your behalf. I remember Psalm, or, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, one of the best verses on this. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That means to, he's saying here to all people. So do not be ashamed that you are a follower of Christ because in fact that you are a Christian, the fact that you know Jesus Christ, that within you is actually the power that can save any person on this world, that can give them eternal life, the power that is within you. So do not be ashamed of that. Do not be ashamed of that. You don't have to have all the answers to everybody's problems, but you can share with them Jesus Christ. And you can say, this is, this is my Savior. This is what he's done for me. 
So don't be ashamed in your trials. And then number five, we see God's correction in trials. God's correction in trials. Verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin. Say those next words with me. At the house of God. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, Peter here takes, again, another, another change in his thought process here. He's looking at the subject of judgment and of trials. And, of course, we know about the coming judgment. But he's trying to say here that sometimes trials and persecutions are used by God to bring judgment and even correction to his people. That's why he says here that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, I don't know if Peter was thinking about Ananias and Sapphira at this time. If you're familiar with that story, these are two people who publicly, openly lied to their church family there in the early church and said one thing, did another, and they were punished severely for it. Now, I don't know if that's what Peter's thinking about here. Judgment coming to the house of God. What's so interesting about that whole story with Ananias and Sapphira is that even though uh, this terrible judgment and just judgment came upon them, God actually used that. It says that in the days to come that many came to Christ and many were added to the church as a result of what happened there. So we see this idea of judgment in trials that leads to correction. And I don't know if he was thinking about them specifically But I think that Peter did know that many times Christians find themselves falling away in their relationship with God. And sometimes God uses trials to get our attention to bring us back to where we need to be. In the Old Testament, how often do we see that with Israel? They fall away from God. He'd send a judge. He'd send somebody to correct them. Or he'd send occupation or persecution for years and years. And then they'd repent. And then he'd bring up somebody, raise somebody up, and they'd be okay again. And then back again in this pattern that just continued over and over and over again. The point is, is that persecution is often used by God as a purifying judgment, as a means of chastisement, as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 teaches us that God corrects his children. He corrects those that he loves. And sometimes... There are trials in your life that are simply God trying to get your attention. You almost then look at it not so much as a trial, but you look at it as a judgment. It's God saying, hey, you need to, let's get your act together. Sometimes God brings trials to churches as well. Corporately, sometimes churches need purging, purifying to be brought back to him. It's so easy to get comfortable, isn't it? It's so easy to get in the rut of complacency and Trials shake those kind of things up. They ignite our focus and our dependence upon the Lord. Somebody said it this way, if God is putting you through a season of suffering in connection with his concern for his glory, he has a desire for abundance in your future. If God is putting you through a season of suffering, and I think I have it up here on the screen, Max, if you can get that up there. If God is putting you through a season of suffering in connection with his concern for his glory, He has a desire for abundance in your future. See, while we keep our trials in the right place of focus, we must remember that sometimes they come to correct us. They come to get things right in our life. And again, this is where our mindset has to, we have to be careful of our mindset. It's the same idea. We look at everything that happens then as some sort of judgment by God. You need to be aware of those kind of things. But what's so interesting is that often a trial will come And in your time of study or in your time of prayer and you're with the Lord, that he will reveal to you that maybe this is something that needs to get right in your life. Again, what happens when trials come? Who do we rush to? We rush to God. And then in prayer, God will reveal to us, well, what about this? (laughs) What about this in your life? And when that happens, we should not fear it. We should not run away from it. We should accept that, okay, God is trying to get something right. Did you know that God does care about how we live and how we think and what's in our hearts? He does. That's great, by the way. That he's not like, all right, all you created beings, you just got to kill and, you know, destroy each other. You do your thing, and at the end of the day, we'll figure out a lot. No, he cares about our influence. He cares about how we are. And so he does speak to us, and he corrects us and see that there can be correction in trials as well. We also know, as the verse reads and. I won't, I won't go too in-depth with the rest of the verse there, verse, uh, verse number 16. Uh, sorry, verse 18. But he's basically saying that, yes, while there's judgment that comes to you that is correcting, 
We also know that those without Christ will face an ultimate judgment. The last thought that we see in this passage is to commit yourself to God in trials, number six. That's a lot of points today. I don't think, I don't think I've preached a six-point message in a long time, long time. I usually try to boil it down, but today I was like, no, we're just going to go with it, okay? Commit yourself to God in trials. Look at verse 19. He says, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Man, this is an encouraging verse to kind of close out this difficult passage. This is an encouraging way to sort of just wrap everything up here. He uses the term commit. He says commit the keeping of their souls. That word commit uh, is a banking term. It means to place in deposit what he is saying here. Here's what, here's what he's saying. He's saying you need to place the treasure, which is your soul, into the care of the trustworthy hands who is the Lord. So he wraps up all this talk about trials and he says, listen, what you need to do is simply entrust your soul, entrust your life into the hands of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, he said this, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And what he's doing is he just sort of brings it to a close, is that when you and I enter into the difficult times of fiery trials, we can take heart that it's according to the will of God. God has not left you abandoned. This trial is not an accident. You know, God doesn't ever say like, oh, sorry, I totally meant that trial for Josh. Sorry, Paul. You know, that was totally for him. No, no, not at all. God doesn't make mistakes. Whatever you're in, he can bring you through, and he will walk with you through that. The God of heaven who knows the number of hairs or lack thereof on our heads. Scripture says that. He only allows what he knows is best for us. So our common response to trials is always resistance, right? It's even resentment. But how much better that when we face trials in life, that we simply open up our hearts, open the doors of our hearts, and welcome the fact that God is trying to do something good in our life. Now understand today, I'm not making light at all whatsoever of the trials that you are in. I've been through some extremely stressful and difficult trials, not to be compared with yours at all whatsoever. So I'm not making light of the things that we go through. But I think we do need to remember that trials are not simply electives in the school of life. <laughs> They're required courses. They're required courses. And so when the trials come, and they will, it's important to remember that God is faithful and we can simply rely on him. As well, when trials come, and sometimes difficulties stay for a time, we need to remember to do the right thing, to take refuge in him, to rest in him. Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary, said this way during one of his own very difficult personal trials. He says, it doesn't matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it becomes between me and God or whether it presses me nearer to his heart. I thought this was a great summation of how we look at trials and the difficulties that we go through. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are great, great difficulties in this life. But it does not matter how great it is or how big it is. What matters is what does it do? Is it pushing us towards Christ? Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, I welcome the wave that crashes me against the rock of ages. I thought that was great. And what a powerful thought that is, that these trials, though they are hard, though they are difficult, we have to remember that if it's pushing us towards God, man, then praise him. Praise him. When those trials come and that difficulty and that suffering, we can commit our souls to him because he is faithful. Did you know that? He is faithful. So I want to ask you this morning, in the trials that you're in right now, in the suffering that you're in going through, Maybe you are facing some persecution. Are you trusting God in that? Are you trusting God in that? I can't answer that question for you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what, what difficult and deep trial you're facing right now. You don't know what I'm facing right now, but I do know this. We have a faithful God who loves us, a God who is willing to walk alongside of us, and a God who most of all wants to walk with you through it. And that's what I love about our God. How in the deep valleys, in the deep waters, in the flame, he is with us and he walks with us. So would you trust him with that today? I want to ask you to just, just take a moment of silence together. And would you bow your head and would you close your eyes just for a moment?